So thank you to all of you. So we are starting uh, this first session uh, of our visual arts uh, focus that is called the French Encounters Art Basel Hong Kong. So we're very glad uh, to share uh, these conversations between uh, Hong Kong, Paris and other countries uh, in Asia. Um, so today we will be starting with the French artist uh, Laurent Grasso, who is uh, here. Hello. Uh, Hello. Hi. Um, as Laurent uh, just had a solo show at Galerie Perrotin in Hong Kong, uh, and um, and he will be uh, in conversation today with Donatien. Gros, um, who is uh, head of contemporary arts programs at Musée d'Orsay. Hello, Donatien. Hello, Adeline. Can you hear me very well? Thank you. And um, so we'll first uh, do a short introduction on uh, Laurent's biography and uh, briefly also on Donatien. And then I will pass you on the word, Donatien, and we'll, you will start with a video. Um, so uh, Laurent, so you, um, Laurent Grasso, so you live and work between uh, Paris and New York, and uh, your work addresses different scales and temporalities uh, across multiple media. Uh, you have questions the structure of the museum, also the, the history of art, uh, themes of nature and culture, uh, as well as notions of science and technology. So you had uh, major uh, exhibitions, uh, including so at Palais de Tokyo, for example, also at uh, Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden uh, in Washington. Um, you also presented um, a solo show at Musée d'Art Contemporain in Montreal, uh, at Fondation Hermès in Tokyo as well. And uh, so the most uh, recent uh, exhibition is the one that we mentioned at Galerie uh, Perrotin in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong. And at, say, at the same time, you're showing at Musée d'Orsay. That's why we have invited uh, Donatien Gros uh, to this uh, conversation. And uh, for the last uh, show we will talk about uh, today, it's the Dirnam uh, Museum of Art uh, in, in uh, South Korea, which is actually a new uh, museum. So Donatien, um, so you, you're a philosopher. Uh, you are also a former student of École Normale Supérieure. Um, you're a graduate of the Institut uh, d'études politiques, uh, science politics of Paris. Um, you also have a doctorate in French and comparative literature from the University of Paris Sorbonne, uh, and a doctorate in uh, philosophy from the Oxford University. Uh, you were also and a, a doctorate in classical philology from the Ecole Pratique des Études, as oh. you're there. Three doctorates. <laughs> All right, thank you. And um, so you were also a visiting curator at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. You also work as an advisor for the Azedin Alaya Foundation. Um, and now, so your um, current position um, is um, so the head of uh, contemporary arts programs at Musée d'Orsay. And I will pass you on the word, Donatien, to start this conversation together with Laurent. Thank you, Adeline. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you to the Institut Francais for uh, this opportunity for Laurent and myself to share a few words. I'll just say one thing um, is in, I'm not head of contemporary arts program, I'm head of contemporary programs period, which includes history, writers, wide range of discussions of our collection, which as you know, is the world preeminent 19th century art collection, European art collection. Um, and so it includes a wide range of you know, discussions. But of course, the most crucial of them is living artists. And the most crucial of the most crucial is of course, um, um, a collaboration with Laurent, which has been, we started really four years ago, even before I arrived. And it's been an extraordinarily uh, emotional moment today, um, literally two hours ago, two hours and a half ago, when we reopened to the public for the first time in seven months. Um, Laurent's work had been, uh, was installed here 
uh, in uh, on uh, I think on October 28th, and it never opened to the public. And it was an extraordinary experience to see, uh, you know, this giant screen. You can see a rendering behind me, and you'll see you'll see a short clip uh, from Laurent, which is really our own turbine hall. Uh, you know, with Laurent's work being created in relation and in response both to the architecture of the museum and of course to the exhibition on the origins uh, of the world the invention of nature in the 19th century so i'll just just would like to say two words that sort of will be a guideline through our conversations before we actually get into uh the reality of the discussion of laurent's projects you know when looking at laurent's work i really see it as being a threshold being a threshold, meaning it's an interstitial space where dimensions get together. So, for example, it's a space where the past or heritage is very present, as you'll see in a number of paintings in, 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 that Laurent made, inspired by, um, you know, eight, the, eight, the 18th century artist, uh, Giuseppe Castiglione. But it's also a threshold to the future. Uh, to looking into times that we do not know that are very enigmatic. It's a threshold to the unknown, and it's sort of a threshold that is fed and nurtured from all the knowledge, all the research that goes into uh, any of Laurent's projects. One final thing I'll say is that this threshold status means that Laurent's work can exist in many scales, and there's a mastery of scale that means that it's not just about let's make this big, let's make this small. It's actually about how can, can art inhabit the world. The screen you see behind me and that you will see in, in the film is eight meter by I think seven, it's a huge screen. But when you look into um, some smaller works, including smaller paintings that Laurent has made, they are sort of gates, gateways into the unknown. And that ability to create a space that is its own space and at the same time is open to all forms of conversation is very idiosyncratic to, to Laurent's work. And maybe that's sort of a, a milestone to have as we watch the first film of, Laurent, of Laurent's exhibitions. Thank you, Donatia. Um, do we start with uh, maybe the, the little uh, movie about my show in Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so um, yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's start. Rather than the data that is visible to us, he actually goes into constructing a pile of data, whereas it is not so visible. Grasso actually goes into talking about the unseen, the invisible data that has been generated throughout nature. Hello everyone, my name is Uli and I am one of the directors in uh, Gallery Periton in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Gallery Periton was established in 1990 by Emmanuel Periton in Paris. In 2012, we opened our Hong Kong location. Currently, we are having a show of uh, French artist Laurent Grasso in the gallery. He intertwines a lot of heterogeneous temporalities, as well as uh, geographies, as well as uh, ultra phenomenons compressed together. He's very interested in the practices of celestial objects, as well as historical references towards humanities. Artificialis comes from uh, a, a, an invitation from a collaboration from Musée d'Orsay. Uh, the main series of the exhibition, the Future Herborium series, actually stems from Artificialis, which is a film that is collaborated um, with uh, Musée d'Orsay um, for an exhibition titled The Origin of the World. Grasso has used two different aspects to cut into this dialogue with the museum. Extending from Charles Darwin's HMS Beagle expedition, Grasso wanted to develop further how basically uh, nature is recorded from centuries ago. 
He is now employing um, high-tech methods such as uh, LiDAR cameras as well as thermosensitive cameras to actually incorporate found images because of the pandemic to produce a film. This film actually is a composition of, of the data um, that has been collected in, uh, through invisible grounds. It collects things that, that we that is through a mega data that is usually very, very uh, com complicated to be deciphered. So the artist also thinks of the film as a, com a collage of data. However, it requires the, the viewers and the readers to decipher uh, throughout the recording of the nature. The film Artificialis will be debuted starting from May in Westbun and Pompidou in Shanghai. Future Arborium is one of the main series being shown in the gallery. From Grasso's point of view, this blurred line of um, human input as well as nature is diminishing the differences. At some point, the artist even believes we live in a post-Anthropocene society where we can no longer distinguish what is derived from nature and what is the human input. There is no longer a clear differences between the two. From Future Herborium series, the artist has collected data from Fukushima area, whereas after the nuclear outbreak, where there has not been any human interference actively, however, the, the remnants of human activities, such as the radioactive material and the wilderness that is allowed currently, uh, creates an imaginary species. The artist is trying to distinguish between human input as well as what is originally natural. So the Future Herborium series is a combined imaginative series based on uh, true natural evidences. I think the artist responds for social issues through a lot of uh, his intentions. I mean, the fact that he would direct certain uh, angles towards this radioactive uh, area and what nature has produced in such area since. It's, it's basically a, a, a reminder of what nature and human are so closely intertwined these days and that it is very difficult to distinguish one from another. Solar Wind is a work um, that is erected by the artist in 2016 on the outskirt of Paris. The artist has worked with four different national agencies, one of them being uh, CNES, um, to collect solar data and transfer them simultaneously onto illustrations and projections onto a building on the outskirt of Paris. This process is from collecting the solar data, coding them and transferring them into light arrays onto the structure that they're being projected on and they are uh, simultaneous with the solar activities and they are uh, in time and, and live. Solar Wind is already being exhibited in the Jonah Museum during its exhibition. I think this actually coincides with the artist's practice. The artist is very much into mixing heterogeneous uh, temporalities. By mixing this older series with his newer series, there is an overlap with time, as well as there is an extension of uh, imagination that uh, there is a cause and effect towards these um, uh, mutation as well as development of these scientific pieces. Within the Studies into the Past series of this exhibition, um, the artist actually inspired by Castiglione um, that incorporated a lot of uh, elements alongside with the traditional Chinese painting so that there creates a mixed culture as well as time um, um, onto one canvas. Maybe after we've seen this film that presents a number of your 
recent projects intertwine the one with the other. Maybe Laurent, the first question I'd like to ask you is how does a Laurent Gasso project work? So how is it structured? There's a central work and then there are works that are born from it. And what is also in the second question in the same question, which is how does that Laurent Gasso project with architecture connect with previous projects? Because the way I see it is that your projects are born the one from the others. There's a very organic growth in your work, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about it. Yeah, you're, you're mute, you're mute. No, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting to see uh, the, the the movie about. Uh, so what we just um, what we just saw is my project uh, Future Herbarium in um, the Hong Kong Perotin Gallery, and we also uh, we also saw some um, extract of my uh, new project Artificialis, uh, commissioned by the Musée d'Orsay. Um, we just opened uh, this morning this uh, this project. So um, usually um, I try to create a kind of constellation and usually the central project is uh, a new movie project. And what I try to do is to create some different kind of uh, artwork. It could be painting, sculpture, uh, neon installation and i want to give the feeling that they cross the screen that they could be like extracted object uh, from the from the movie and usually i try to show everything together in a in a in the same space but um with uh, artificialis um it works differently it's like i have the the first chapter at the Musée d'Orsay and some other extension um, in Hong Kong with Perrotin at the Geona Museum in Korea. And uh, it's a kind of uh, labyrinth and um, some uh, with some hidden room. And uh, of course, it's not like, um, I'm not doing just one kind of uh, one kind of artwork that you could recognize. Uh, it's more difficult to uh, link things together. But um, we can say that uh, for me, the exhibition is the final artwork. And um, what I try to, to give also is um, um, the first vision is really uh, physical, sensorial, and visual. And after, by the little um, leaflet or by the edition, by the different publications that uh, we are doing, I try to provide more information about my project. So it takes time to uh, to understand and to, uh, to 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 see a kind of a guideline. Which leads me to a very difficult second question: um, What do you see? as being the DNA of Laurent Gasso's art? Like what makes your art? What, is, what, it, what makes it what it is? So um, for the project Artificialis at Musée d'Orsay, um, uh, the way I'm working, so first of all, I have a studio in Paris and we are between five and 10 people. And what I like when I have this kind of invitation is to do a lot of research and to understand the place, um, the history of the place, the ghost of the place. And also, I like to meet the institution. I like to, to meet the people I'm working with. And basically, I'm, I'm using the vibration and the, the history of the place to create something new. I like this idea that um, each uh, invitation, it's a new project with a, a, new, uh, a new field. Um, for the Musée d'Orsay, I was really inspired by um, 
the idea of exploration and the, the big shows that uh, you have now about uh, um, the evolution theory and Darwin. And uh, this is something um, really inspiring for me because um, I used to work with this idea of exploration. And the question of the project was, what could, what could we um, explore today at the 21st century? What is possible, what is still possible to, to explore? And what, what is the mysterious part of the world of today? Um, so I tried to, I started to collect uh, data about different uh, interesting places in the world and about this idea of mutation and metamorphosis of uh, different uh, places. And um, I had this idea of a new kind of, like the, the boat of Darwin, a, a new kind of spectral vessel um, uh, crossing different uh, situation in our contemporary world. And, and I had also the idea to work with a new kind of tool to um, understand the world of today. So I used the uh, LiDAR scanner, hyperspectral cameras, uh, thermosensitive cameras. And um, I thought that that could be the, the tools of today, the, the, the way we could explore the world. And I started also to be interested by different kind of concept. Uh, the idea of the, um, the disappearance of the, distinct, the distinction between nature and culture, for example, uh, the concept of post-Anthropocene as well. And the idea that we, have, we are already after uh, the, the Anthropocene. So I start to collect ideas, feeling about the places, um, a kind of little study about the architecture. I was also really inspired by the architecture of Musée d'Orsay, this old uh, sta train station. And uh, slowly, um, the film project takes the first uh, stage because it's my main practice. And some little uh, different, some other signs start to appear. And I started to create the painting with uh, this idea of uh, an herbarium of the future. And I started to imagine flowers of the future. So I don't know if it's, it's just to give you an idea the way I'm thinking. And maybe we, we could uh, show a few pictures of the Musée d'Orsay. There's a little, there's a film, I think, that we mm -hmm. could Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here you can see some, um, uh, it's a shooting with a drone in the nave of Orsay. And uh, as you can see, uh, I uh, installed a big uh, LED screen at the end of the space. And here um, you can have a, a few extract of the, of the film itself, Artificialis. So the first, uh, the, the beginning of the movie, is uh, using the technology I mentioned before, the LiDAR. So it's a way to do some scanner of uh, landscape. And after, with a virtual camera, it's possible to navigate inside of this uh, uh, virtual uh, landscape. Là, ça marche pas du tout. So sorry because the, the 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 quality is not so so, so good.
Okay. Uh, we we will make available a link on the on the movie uh, for the the one who are interested to to, to see it uh, with its full length. It's twenty six minutes. So. Uh, all right. If we can share maybe that on the chat, the link as soon as you have it. Of you course. It on the yes. Chat, yeah. It's it's on Vimeo. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think one one thing that's quite striking about the film is that it's a film about post nature. It's a film in dialogue with the architecture of the Musée d'Orsay. In a sense, it's also an installation. You know, the screen is very much part of how it's presented here. Um, but it's also a film about the status of images. You know, what images are, what an Im a found image can be, what a semi-artificial image can be. Maybe can you tell us a little bit about the process in which you selected the image and also what it means in general about the status of images in your work? Yeah. It's interesting because there is a parallel between the status of the nature and uh, the status of the picture. And um, since the beginning of my practice, I've been always interested to create it some ambiguous situation. As a viewer, um, what I like is to be a little bit lost and not to understand properly what I'm seeing. And I like this idea that um, um, there is no um, it's not an, uh, something um, evident. Uh, when uh, you see the picture of the movie, it's not possible to distinguish what is uh, um, artificial, what is uh, created with special effect, what is a real picture or a virtual picture of a landscape. And uh, obviously my work is dealing with uh, the multiple status of the uh, pictures that I try to, to put together. Um, the music is also really important. Um, and um, for this project, we had the, the pleasure to work with uh, Warren Ellis um, and he composed a special soundtrack for the, for the project. So, uh, for example, we have um, some special effect and uh, uh, I try to show you maybe an example, les, les feux dans la glace. And uh, we, um, we mixed with the LiDAR technology and it's um, at, at one point, it's not possible anymore to, to know what is real, what is virtual, uh, what was created because I also, um, I've also uh, selected some um, very strange but real uh, places, uh, and they, uh, in a way, they amplify this uh, this feeling of uh, ambiguity. Tu peux montrer différentes séries de d'images. Ouais. Voilà, merci. I show you just a, a, a few. Uh, Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, that's the way uh, I, I work with this idea of uh, picture and ambiguity. One thing that I think is really striking about your work is how it tackles um, the world we live in. So obviously artificialis is about states of the world and the images come from everywhere and that's also an interesting fact that there's no one single origin for these images but then of course your your work has also been and is also going to be shown widely in the united states and now uh, you have these multiple exhibitions in in asia um, and i know that you've been giving a lot of thought as to what would make sense in Hong Kong and Shanghai. And, you know, can you tell me about the world of Lohong Gaso? So how, how do you deal with the world as it is? It's geography, it's changes. What is the world of Lohong Gaso? Geog geographically? 
<laughs> it's an open question. No, of course, um, the pleasure as an artist to be invited in a different, for example, in different biennial, um, offer uh, always an extension of uh, um, the, 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 the knowledge and the, the meeting with different culture. Um, so I, I try to use uh, these invitations to uh, explore different uh, uh, ideas and um, to uh, be inspired for a new project. Like for example, when I was invited by the Sydney Biennale, uh, by Mami uh, Kataoka, uh, I think it was like four or five years ago. Um, I created this project Otto um, about uh, sacred site, Aboriginal sacred site that have been allowed to, to, to film. And it was really interesting. Uh, and uh, um, this is like a, a kind of uh, uh, I feel really lucky. Uh, I've been, uh, a, a, I was studying in New York, in London, and I had the chance to be invited by different uh, um, binal or by different institutions all over the world. And uh, for me, it's really important. Uh, and this is one of the good part of the mondialization. Uh, this idea that uh, we can exchange, like we are doing today, actually, we can share ideas and, uh, um, in a way, it's a way to um, have some extension uh, and some new um, opportunity to, to discover some new point of view on, on the world. In the meantime, I work a lot with a scientist with different research program. Um, I was helped by Grégory Kenney for uh, Artificialis, the project at, at, at Musée d'Orsay. Uh, Grégory is working closely with uh, Bruno Latour. And uh, we had uh, some very interesting discussion. Um, and um, he's um, helping me to visualize some interesting uh, research, some interesting phenomenon. Uh, together, uh, we... Um, we did some research about this meson, meson uh, bubbles, the, the gas that uh, we start to, to have more and more in the, in the North Pole because it's escaping from the ice. Uh, I, I had the pleasure to, to meet different scientists with him. So I try to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to have a lot of different sources of inspiration, but at the end, what I like is in a way to, to mute this part and to leave the viewer as the first, uh, um, first vision of my work without uh, to be too uh, um, loud or to be uh, without to give too many information. There's also something about your work that is quite striking. It's it's otherworldliness. So you have you have you have a fascination for ghosts or the notion of the ghost. There are some ghost images already in the film, images from the past that are sort of coming, bursting to the present. There's a notion of vibration that's also very important for you that the work creates a vibration. So can you tell me a little bit about that aspect, the ghost, the vibration, the otherworldly? whether they connect or do not connect in your, in your work? Yeah, as an artist, um, it's really interesting to deal and to work with the idea of uh, invisibility. Um, during the 20th century, the artist and the art world start to work a lot with the installation and space and the, the, the artwork start to, uh, to grow and uh, um, we uh, escape from the little frame that we had before. And I like this idea, for example, for an installation. Um, since uh, I was a student, I started to use the light, the architecture of the place, um, the ghost of the place in the sense that I start to do some, I started to do some research at Jeux de Paume in Paris for my show. Um, I was interested by uh, 
uh, Bernard Palissy because uh, he was commissioned for uh, uh, a place just close from the Jeu de Paume. So I asked to manufacture the set to loan some pieces that we could find a few centuries ago, uh, really close from the museum. So um, this idea of ghosts are not like something, it's not something esoteric or uh, even if I'm also really interested by the stories that people can tell themselves to, uh, to, to, to live in a way uh, for their own life, I mean. Um, so uh, in another, in another way, uh, for the project Artificialis, I explore this invisible part um, through the help of different tools that I mentioned before. I like this idea that our, the visible is um, extended uh, today by, uh, like when we discovered the X-rays, we have been able to see uh, through the body, the human body, and with the with the lidar today, it's possible to to see through the ocean um, and um, with the help of this uh, technology, uh, some scientists uh, have been able to discover some uh, new kind of archaeology, for example. So it's it's a real it's a real thing, but it's also something quite uh, mysterious and new. So I, I, I like this kind of uh, paradox uh, between science and uh, beliefs. Which also leads to another question, which is the notion of presence, you know, being present. And how, is, how important is it for you to this notion of presence, that there would be something that would be there and not there at the same time? Um, very often also I try to deal with um, uh, the aesthetic of uh, science or, or technology, but also the way some objects are like uh, um, charged with some beliefs. And I like the idea of the magical object, of course, and the idea that um, what we see is not uh, what it is, or you know, th th this idea that uh, one of my artwork could be crossed by different kind of um, uh, stories. Um, as, a, as an example, um, the next project we will show at uh, TARP in, uh, in France is a project where I will, um, I will do an installation with so new, new pieces and uh, focus about the idea of uh, waves and frequencies. So um, we will show some object and these objects are um, generating real frequencies. Um, and these frequencies are uh, filling uh, the space of exhibition. To you... Taria? Uh, so, uh, um, sorry, I thought we have some picture, but it's too new. Uh, so this is a very interesting for me. It's again, uh, this um, uh, inspiration of the invisible word. And uh, invisible word doesn't mean uh, something uh, just about uh, strange stories and ghosts. It's also uh, a, a scientific uh, concept. And um, so, for example, in this new exhibition project, we will uh, use a frequency discovered by uh, Schumann. Um, he discovers a frequency of 7.83 uh, Hertz. And this is supposed to, this supposed to be the frequency of the Earth. So uh, we will um, generate uh, this uh, frequency in the exhibition space. You were talking about a magical object. So is the artwork the quintessential magical object? Yes. <laughs> Elaborate. I think that um, when, uh, if we take, for example, um, one of my painting, um, I try to, uh, for example, Futur Herbarium, 
uh, it deals with uh, the aesthetic of the 18th century of the classical uh, herbarium, but also uh, it deals with uh, some new kind of mutation um, and also um, the status of the object is not really obvious because it's not really uh, easy for a viewer um, who uh, doesn't know my work to understand if the object is old or new. So what I mean is that what I try to do is when an object is crossed by different kind of forces, it gives a kind of uh, radiance, a kind of presence, as you said before. And um, uh, the, the fact that it's not clear uh, create some uh, question. And I like this tension, and this is what I try to create. Another question I want to ask you is about scale, because one thing that really strikes me with, with your work, as I mentioned earlier, is that you can work at a very minute scale to, with a very small, relatively small, but an extremely precise painting, as well as mastering the giant scale of the nave of the Musée d'Orsay. So I'm really interested in how you approach this different scale, how you can make, you could make an exhibition just of tiny paintings, but you can also work at this scale. And I don't know many artists who can do that. You know, some artists can work really big, but then when it gets smaller, they don't really know how to master it. And others, it's the opposite. In your case, you have this ability to go from very small to very big. So can you tell me a little bit about how you approach that, if scale is an issue or not an issue, and how you can sort of juggle it? Yes, um, when I was a student at the Beaux-Arts de Paris, uh, I remember I was invited by um, Parcours Saint-Germain. It's a kind of a public uh, project uh, night. Uh, it's like Nuit Blanche in another way. And uh, I was invited to create a project. And um, this is something I was always um, really uh, curious to, to, to do is um, the fact to install something in the public space without to be in the frame of the museum or, or the gallery. And to create this kind of uh, meeting between somebody, it's not a viewer because uh, it's not, it's, of course, when you do this kind of event, you have uh, you have like viewers. They come specially for the project, but you have also just people walking in the street. And since the beginning of my practice, I try um, to to create a lot of uh, I try to create a lot of public project and to uh, to do a lot of public commission because I like also uh, this uh, situation and. Um, where you have no explanation, you have no frame, you are, it's, it's a kind of challenge for the artist. Because in a way, when you are at Musée d'Orsay or uh, at uh, Palais de Tokyo or whatever, um, you, have, uh, you, you have viewers uh, and they come because they know or they want to discover uh, my work. What I like also is to create some kind of uh, visual enigma in the public space. And um, of course, uh, it's also possible to create really a tiny uh, and little scale in the public space. But uh, in, uh, for a few times, I was invited to do real like big scale project like the solar wind that we saw at the beginning. Uh, it's uh, 40 meters silos on the peripheric of Paris. And I create this project with the help of the, the CNES. Uh, so uh, we collect some uh, data about the sun activity and we turn these data uh, into a light uh, installation on these two towers of 40 meters. And this is really interesting because you can see the installation um, when uh, you, when you land in Paris at Orly Airport, it's possible to see the installation. So it's a really interesting scale for an artist. But what I think also is that as an artist, um, 
you need to be um, able to work at any scale in a way uh, regarding the kind of invitation regarding the space what i like is to to be able to give the right uh, answer the right response at any kind of invitation and i don't want to do just like big project or just like little project it's more that uh, regarding the context of the invitation i try to find what is interesting to do uh, maybe we we could uh, we could show a few pictures from the geonam project uh, in korea <laughs> so this is a project uh, we opened like uh, one month ago it's a new museum uh, near Gwangju. and uh, i have uh, four uh, four rooms uh, this is the entrance So the first room. So we decided to use some different different kind of colors for each room. This is a solar wind um, with uh, the future herbarium uh, theory and some uh, sculpture. The future herbarium it's all, it's a series of painting, but also a series of uh, of uh, bronze uh, sculpture. So each room, uh, you have a central movie project with different uh, artwork connected with the project. This is uh, the project that I mentioned before for the Sydney uh, Sydney Biennale, uh, Otto. For this project, you created some uh, spheres floating in different kind of uh, in different uh, sacred sites and here it's a project i've done about uh, uh, where uh, we can see uh, pompeii and, and the volcano stromboli uh, soleil noir Yeah, we we will make available also this uh, this film uh, for um, I I may have two more questions for you, Laurent, for today. The first one is about precision. I, I'm you know working with you for for four years on you know artificialis and also some kind of um, parallel projects we've sort of included in the framework of our collaboration at the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, I've been really struck by how precise you are. You're at the same time precise and open. So you're very open to conversations, to discussions, to exploring ideas. That's actually your work is very collaborative in that regard, but you're also very precise. So can you tell me a little bit about your precision and how it connects with your openness? which you know we've heard and seen throughout this conversation i think that uh, what i like uh, for example for the movie again uh, for the movie artificialis uh, because of the lockdown we we were stuck in uh, in paris and uh, i i work uh, I had a lot of time to 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 work, and uh, it was difficult even to to to, to stop the process because uh, we collected so many interesting uh, pictures. We start to produce special effects. We start to produce a virtual camera for the lidar uh, scanner. That uh, it was a kind of endless, uh, and we had a kind of vertigo. I don't know if it's about precision, but. Uh, um, it was um, it, it's a pleasure for the, for an artist to uh, come and again and again on the same object and to 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 work in the, and at the end you have the opening of your project so it's necessary to to stop this process but uh, in a way we we could have worked for 
like uh, one year uh, on on the same uh, on the same movie. Uh, we started to imagine a real time with a artificial intelligent uh, uh, program to do an, um, a kind of uh, uh, editing, uh, real, real time editing done by uh, a machine. Uh, so uh, it's just that uh, in a way the invitation by a museum or uh, any kind of project gives a kind of limit, a kind of timeline for uh, the, the brain activity and uh, it makes that uh, it's necessary to, to deliver something, even if it's not really uh, the appropriate uh, word for, for what we are doing. So that's the way we work and um, Precise mean a kind of endless process. Okay. And my last question to you, Laurent. You use a word um, that I think kind of encapsulates your work in a very direct way, and that's enigma. You know, when there is an invitation to you, it is like asking you a riddle, and you you address enigmas and you create enigmas. So can you tell me, tell us a little bit more to finish this conversation about the role of enigmas in your work, your life, and your world? Yeah, for me, enigma is a kind of intellectual challenge. Uh, it's this idea to be um, always uh, stimulated and uh, interested by new kind of theory, new kind of meeting, and... Um, I think that uh, we have a lake of enigma, <laughs> but in the meantime, one thing I, I like to say is that I'm always more interested by reality and by science and by science fiction or by uh, uh, fiction itself, because uh, as we as we can see, the reality is always uh, stronger uh, <laughs> than the, the fiction itself. Uh, but uh, I think the enigma, uh, this idea of enigma is a kind of uh, process also to catch, catch the attention of the viewer. Uh, like, for example, the soundtrack of all my projects, uh, they provide a kind of um, a change of uh, consciousness and they provide the, the, the right level of uh, attention of the viewer. Um, to, in a way, uh, provide this kind of um, state of mind where you are uh, you are in a in a kind of floating moment, and this is what I, I, I try to create. You know, uh, this idea to extract the viewer for from its own temporality and its own uh, words. You know, to 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 create a kind of a strange moment. Um, a lot of, um, we are surrounded by very uh, clear uh, information and very clear mes messages. Uh, and we are influenced and uh, it, it's really interesting and, and in the meantime difficult to, to, to stop this uh, channel and to, to to take the viewer in another in, in another space, and, but this is what we try to do. Thank you so much, Laurent, for giving us a little glimpse onto the Laurent Gasso state of mind. <laughs> now that we are ready to welcome here at the Musée d'Orsay visitors to see for the first time in France after seven months your film and installation, Artificialis. Thank you, Donatia. Thank you very much, Laurent. So we are about to finishing this uh, conversation. So if there are no more questions uh, on the chat, so maybe I have um, one more um, questions because um, you mentioned that. I mean, I wanted to know um, uh, regards to the pandemic. I wanted to know how far it affected your work. Um, I mean, we could see that maybe from the film Artificialist that you explored new ways of uh, creating images 
maybe these images were not filmed by yourself or I, I don't know, I mean, it's, uh, you still want to keep it uh, enigmatic. Um, and um, yes, I wanted to, to know how it, um, uh, which impact it had on, on your um, entire work, because we can see also that you had many exhibitions abroad. So it seems like, uh, um, I mean, you still, um, you, you still work as, uh, as before, and I wanted to know um, if, if, if you, you felt really affected. Yes. Um, so, yeah, of course, there are different levels of um, the effect about the, the, the effect of this uh, situation. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we stopped to travel, and I stopped to travel, and I, um, for me, it was a kind of uh, privilege to, and uh, I, I felt lucky to, to be able to stay, uh, to, to stay at my studio, at my place, and to work, uh, because uh, um, I was used to, to travel a lot, and I like that, of course. But um, it was a new. Um, yeah, new way to 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 work, uh, and uh, we start to. I was really lucky that the Musée d'Orsay uh, didn't cancel uh, our project, so I had work to do, and uh, I, I had so it was a, uh, it was uh, not so difficult for me because uh, I had this project to finish, uh, and uh, for once I had like uh, plenty of time to to. To, to work on it. Um, it was also uh, a kind of, um, uh, we, we realized um, the number of distractions, the number of, uh, uh, of uh, interference uh, that you can have as an artist. Uh, and uh, um, the fact to be, uh, not to be able to to travel uh, was an interesting moment, uh, but again, it's difficult because um, in the meantime, um, I felt really lucky, and I know a lot of uh, young artists uh, didn't have the same uh, number of projects, so uh, uh, it was also a strange moment where. Um, you can see that uh, it's not really well organized, and some um, the, 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 for artists, especially uh, the, the protection was not so strong uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, everything can be cancelled from one day to the other. So uh, it was a. In the meantime, uh, it was an interesting moment, but it was also a moment where we understood. Uh, uh, or fragile uh, our, our situation, um, but um, yeah, uh, we we did like uh, I don't know five projects in Asia. Uh, um, I, I feel now I would like to to, <laughs> to have some holidays because I, actually we we keep working like in, in very intense uh, way since uh, since one year. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Laurent, for this very inspiring uh, uh, conversation together with Donatien. We are very eager to see the exhibition at Musée d'Orsay, finally. Maybe, Donatien, you can see, you can show us the background. You can see the screen behind you. That's where the, the film is projected in the screen hall. Very beautiful, um, uh, amazing uh, hall. So um, we are finishing right now the conversation. Thank you so much. And we will see you all uh, tomorrow. Uh, we will meet at 9 a.m. Uh, Paris time, which, which is actually 3 p.m. Uh, Hong Kong time uh, at K11 Art Foundation. Uh, we'll be starting a talk with Aidan Lee and a young French artist Theodora Barra uh, having a, an exhibition there in Hong Kong uh, together uh, with Angel Leung. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Merci Laurent. Bye. Thank you Laurent. Thank you Donatien. Bye bye to everybody. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.